we left on, a, on the highest possible note a television show could leave on. I don't think you could do better. And so I'm so aware of the relationship that an audience has to TV. The loyalty, the legacy, the, the feeling of returning to something. You always return to the shows that leave you wanting more. You never return to the shows that overstay their welcome. Prepare your ears, humans. Happy, Sad, Confused begins now. I'm Josh Horowitz, and today on Happy, Sad, Confused, we're live at the 92nd Street Y with Schitt's Creek creator and Good Grief director, Mr. Dan Levy, everybody. Um, this New York City audience has just seen this wonderful new Netflix film, Good Grief. This is Dan's writing, directing, starring debut in feature film format, the first of many. I'm sure you'll agree it is a beautiful piece of work. We all, yes, come on, guys. You guys all, you all laughed, you cried, you did all the things. That's what Dan Levy does. He does it so well. Um, this is such a thrill to have him on the podcast for the very first time. We're going to spread the good word of this. You guys have sold out this theater, by the way. Amazing. Well done. Well done. Um, please give a warm New York City welcome. His first time on Happy, Sad, Confused, Mr. Dan Levy, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Such a thrill to be here. This is awesome, Dan. Congratulations. This is a moment. Thank you. This is a big moment. Thanks. I mean, thanks. We can say officially, Dan Levy, filmmaker. <laughs> How does that feel? How well, does my that film sound? school, I didn't get a degree. I dropped out, but at least the theoretical degree I would have gotten now has come to good use. There you go. Look, I mean, you're one of those. I mean, I mean this in the nicest possible way. Uh oh. Um, psychopaths who wrote, directed, and starred yeah, in their yeah, own yeah. film. Christopher Nolan didn't do that. Eat your heart out. <laughs> Come on. I have uh, one thing over Christopher Nolan. Yes. It's amazing. <laughs> but, you know, in all seriousness, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, a lot about the film and the entire career, but what does this moment feel like? Because I know this has been a long time coming, and I'm sure this has been on your mind for a while, and I don't know, is there a sense of satisfaction, relief? What are you feeling Yeah, right it's now? like, it's satisfaction, it's relief, it's excitement that I get to kind of share it with people, but there's also just like... I don't know, it's it, like f fear and anxiety and um, all these weird things that creep into my head like on the best of days, but now they're kind of exacerbated <laughs> to the point of like, you know, um, well, doing things like this and like playing it for giant theaters full of people. Um, but it's great. It's an exercise in learning to just accept the good things, right. you know? Well, it's fun to like, yeah, chase that thing you want, yes, chase that thing you want, and then you're like, oh wait, but this also brings me fear and anxiety, like I'm chasing, but I, this is what I wanted, right? And yet... Well, it's interesting, because I think what a lot of people, well, I don't want to speak for people, so I'll speak for myself. What I really like is the actual tangible process of making things. This is a sort of part of it that it, I mean, I love being here, don't get me wrong, but the, the actual like publicizing of things is less comfortable than actually making it. So in a way, it's like in a perfect world, you'd kind of just like make it and then it would be out and people would like it and that would be that. Um, no, this is the price you pay. You have I to know, suffer but in front of us. You have there are, to dance for us, Dan. There, Come on. And there are people out there who genuinely live for this part. Yeah. And I would kind of kill for that self-confidence. I will say, and we're going to go full circle later on in the conversation, this is a special treat for me because I've known Dan over the years and we've kind of had these kind of weird parallel lives because Dan, um, and we'll get to it, but like you had the MTV life in Canada and yeah. I've had the MTV life in the US and we would cross yeah. paths and I just want to say at the outset, and I've said this to you before, it's just been such a joy to see the, the arc of your career and people know how difficult it is to go from one side to the other and just like, I'm just so happy for all your success. Well, I so appreciate like, that and I'm so happy for your success. Yeah. So, okay, let's talk a little uh, about this wonderful film. So the audience here has seen it, but we're not going to spoil it for all the folks listening on the podcast. Um, but take me back. Um, 
2020, kind of a, a crazy year to say the least. Yeah. Um, we're all experiencing loss and trauma in that year. You suffer some losses like many mm -hmm. of us uh, did. And I guess take us through that, ex those experiences and how that, how that gave birth to good grief. I never thought I would ever write a screenplay. I was too intimidated by the process of it. I could, you know, make it, 80 episode television show, but I could, for some reason, like sitting down to write an actual screenplay was so scary. Um, and I never really thought about it. I never even knew if that was something I would ever get to do in my life, like make a film. And, and then through the process of the pandemic and, and losing my grandmother, um, playing with the idea, not playing with the idea because that feels kind of reductive, but it was more like trying to make sense of the grief that I was experiencing in relation to the general grief we were all experiencing was a really confusing thing. And I was trying to figure out what it meant to me. I was trying to figure out whether I was doing it properly. All of these very strange questions that felt like they shouldn't be related to grief and yet they were. And that to me was, in that moment I thought, well maybe there is a movie here. And so I started to sit down and figure out what that could look like. Is that, is that a debate in your own brain? Because then I would imagine, again, for us overthinkers out there, where you're like, okay, so I'm experiencing this loss, I'm questioning how I'm receiving the loss and how I'm interpreting it, and now I want to make art of, out of it. Is that, is that, am I exploiting my own grief? Like, you know but as I mean? a writer, that's, what that's kind that's of it. the only way that I can do it. Because I'm far less articulate in, like, f f in my mouth than I am with my hands. <laughs> As, as just exemplified <laughs> this evening. Um, wow, scary. But, so it was almost this, it was almost like journaling. A lot of people write, th if, you, if you can write, if you love writing, a lot of people tend to turn to writing to try to make sense of what they're doing. Sure. So writing this script was not only a, a challenge in a time when I, I needed one, but it was also an opportunity to try and figure out what I was thinking. And over the course of, I think, three plus months, I ended up, well, I bought Save the Cat. Some Save writers the Cat out being there. a screenwriting yep. book. Yeah, claps for Save the Cat. <laughs> um, but I started from scratch. It was a completely different discipline, ultimately. And I had no kind of hubris about what I was capable of. So for me, it was about starting at the very beginning and figuring out what are the things I needed, following a kind of rubric of like, how do you put these ideas in order, asking friends who were screenwriters to come in and sit with me and look at my beat board and say, you know, I think maybe that scene could go there and switch some things and maybe you can get some more out of this scene if you just put it here or did that. It was a real kind of collaborative process by, you know, in, in letting people in and recognizing that I didn't know what I was doing. And isn't that like the, yeah, the conundrum, right? Like you come off Schitt's Creek and you have like all these opportunities seemingly, you could probably do a lot of different things and yet you still have to start with a blank page. Like you're still at squ like square one, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, great, I won every Emmy known to man. <laughs> I still need to, I still need to start, yeah. start over. Yeah. And that's exciting, and it's also daunting. It was totally daunting, and yet, at the end of it, I knew that there was something special here, at least in terms of something that I knew I would watch, and I think that's the, that's the best place to start. Yeah. It's like, if, if, if it's something you feel like you would watch, then maybe it's something that other people would wanna watch too, and I also feel like I tend to respond best to, to movies and to, to scripts that feel really personal to the, filmmaker or to the to the screenwriter um, and yet we live in this age where so much is made for public consumption right and not for the people who are making it and so I, I don't know I just felt like there was something interesting in in the script and so we took it and people also liked it and now I'm on this stage talking to you well and, and you gather this um, and then a bunch of stuff happened in between yes, I'm, no, no, no. Let's mention one or two of those things, namely... <laughs> uh, making it. Making it. Casting yeah. it. Well, I was going to say casting editing it. it. I mean, you have Himesh Patel, you have Ruth Nega, who we were discussing about backstage, as we always should. Yeah. Um, it must just be... Like, and, and these are obviously very key roles and important to cast, and to establish this 
these deep yeah. friendships. I mean, Shit's Creek, you have years to kind of like build it up. Oh yeah. Here, day one, how did you establish that? Obviously, there's the script, but did you we, did you I, have a path to how you were going to? I built in that two weeks of rehearsal for us, and we all just got together every day for like six, seven hours a day, and talked, talked about our relationship to loss, talked about our relationship to love, talked about our relationship to friendship and relationships, and and it really kind of cracked open this lovely dynamic between the three of us, and we did an escape room. I heard this. Are you an escape room guy? I love an escape room. Are you good? Am I in no, an I'm room? terrible at an escape room. You do not want me anywhere near an escape room. But I love them and I'll show up whether I'm invited or not. But the so doing all doing all of these different things to try to actively crack us all open and get us close. Right. The escape room we did with Ulla Berkland, who was the director of photography on the film, and Zoe, our, our first AD, because part of it, for me, was not just the camaraderie between the cast, it was also the comfort that they had with the people who were gonna be very close to them from the crew. So bringing in key members of our crew to also get to know the cast before we started shooting felt like a way of easing that first day because we come in on the party, and that was the first, we were in that house for the first five days of our shoot. And those relationships had to feel so lived in. You're coming into like a 15 year relationship with these people. And so it was important. So we did that, we went to the country with Luke to get to know Luke. Um, it was important. And I, it, it became very, I mean, it was in the, in the first chemistry read with Ruth and Himesh and I, it was very clear that there was something sort of special there. One of the many things I love about this, and it's no surprise given your attention to detail, fashion, costumes on Schitt's Creek, et cetera, but like the level of production design and feel and just, uh, it's so meticulous. Clearly you've put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into every aspect that we're seeing on screen in this. E yeah. No? No, yes. Absolutely. We like, yeah. There were like two boxes of that were shipped in from my own living room. Um, <laughs> I like a throw, you know? Um, <laughs> I knew that I had the like perfect camel throw like, in my house. Just the one. Get it in a box, <laughs> ship it to set. Um, but Alice Normington, who was the production designer, did just an unbelievable yeah. job, and and you know Julian Day, who did the costumes. But it was yeah, you have production design and costume are two of the most invaluable ways to tell, to to speak to a, to, to someone's life yeah. without having to write that. And so I've always really valued production design and costume design because it's a way of revealing character without having to make the characters speak to it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know. Can, can you make a film of this type, a drama with some comedic elements set in Europe without, you know, worshiping at the altar of the Richard Curtis, of even the Nancy Myers, of like, are, are those your, somewhat your touchstones or? Yeah, I mean, yeah, in that I, I completely admire what they've been able to do, and I think they've essentially, like, opened the doors of possibilities for, for younger filmmakers to say, oh, I want my version of that. Right. You know, you can create these really beautiful places that an audience will want to return to, hopefully. Um, so that was really important. I wanted... The subject matter was quite heavy, and so part of the balance of it all for me was creating these locations and these spaces and, and making the film look and feel really sumptuous so that even when the times were tough, there was a softness and there was a beauty to, um, to what was going on around them that essentially protected the audience from feeling like they were in unsafe territory, if that makes yeah, any sense. Yeah, it does. does. Does making a film about grief unlock anything, does it fix, not fix you, but like help you in understanding how you handle grief going forward? I mean, is, the, is it? Yeah, well, funnily enough, I, like, I don't think it answers anything because I don't think grief has a resolution. I think 
it was interesting. Um, the the there was some really sort of lovely words written in the New York Times about the movie, and I, I found them really profound. This idea, I think, I don't want to summarize, well, I'm going to. But it basically was like, <laughs> but it was, it, the last sort of sentiment was that the, essentially saying that the movie doesn't offer a resolution, but rather uh, uh, something about, rather kind of inspires this idea that we just have to love our way through it. And that was, that is someone who got the film. You know, that to me was one of the greatest takeaways reading something that was so beautifully expressed, I butchered it, um, <laughs> that spoke to my own experience, which is what I came to realize in the process of trying to figure out my own grief. I lost my dog five days before I started writing this, this script as well. And so um, that was almost like a... That was almost like a full house audience. Felt it. <laughs> that was like Felt it. really sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I think to me, the, the, one of the greatest like magic moments of, of writing this movie was the scene with Imelda at the end. Um, because I had no control over the words in a way. Like, the scene just wrote itself. I had gotten to a place in the script where I think I had detangled my own um, feelings enough to let that little sentiment, like, make its way to the page. And it didn't, I didn't think about it. It was just there at the end of the day. And I looked down and I thought, well, that is what I'm feeling. That was the answer to my question. Um, and also becomes the, sort of the answer to Mark's question and, and many of the characters in, in the film. It sort of speaks to the whole experience of it. Does, does this experience especially, I mean, it seems like, I know this wasn't a calculated move in the, like, I'm going to zig where they expect me to zag after Schitt's Creek, but this does start to establish you as it's like a, there are themes, there are, there, 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 there are familiar aspects of this for anybody that loves Schitt's Creek, and yet this is a different tone, obviously. Does it feel like, I mean, if, if we're charting the next 10, 20 years of your career, do you think it's going to feel more like this or more like what we know from Schitt's Creek? I don't Creek? know. And I hope I get the opportunity to be surrounded by people who, like, want to take that ride. Yeah. You know, because I think all you can really do is support people whose ideas you love. And I think the worst thing we can do, which is what this industry does all the time, is take someone's success and box them into being only that. Yeah, give me four more of those. There's yeah. so many actors and writers and directors and artists out there who have been boxed in. And if you don't have the strength of mind to realize that there, you can f fucking open that box and find some other place to be, um, it can really swallow you up. And so for me, the greatest tragedy is the idea that anyone would feel boxed in by their own success. So this almost came as a reaction to wanting to just explore something different. You do 80 episodes of a, of a comedy, even though it, we've always, as a writer, we always looked at Schitt's Creek as a drama. Inherently, it's very sad. It's, Stop laughing. There's nothing funny about it. Not where it. I'd expect the laugh, but you know what? I'm desperate and I'll take it. Um, but yeah, it was inherently dramatic. Heartless people out there. Now we've, we've opened it a little bit and they can't be stopped. You yeah, exactly. <laughs> now I know. Um, I just want to go where my curiosity takes me, and I, I am very grateful to Netflix for understanding what this meant to me and saying yes. Because there was a world where they could have said no, and it was almost, you know, <laughs> we came close. But they said yes, and that means the world. And that changed my career. And sometimes you have to invest in people's curiosity instead of constantly putting profit yep. and what people want 
or what you think people want. Nobody knows what people want. That's why all the great movies end up pushing through and doing so well. The movies that cost no money and end up making a hundred million. All those movies that, you know, some executive somewhere was like, this is weird. I don't know if an audience will get it. <laughs> Guess what? Audiences are a lot smarter than so many people give them credit for. So, yeah, that means a lot. It, it meant a lot to me, and I, I hope that I can continue to have that support, and we'll see. This episode of Happy, Sad, Confused is brought to you by BetterHelp. Well, the new year has come and gone, and it's a time of year when we all make those resolutions. And I think a lot of people get caught up in trying to remake their life and go extreme and really just like change everything all at once, when the truth is... You're succeeding. You've found ways to better your life. And with something like therapy and something like BetterHelp, you can find those strengths and build upon them. Instead of just wholesale changing your life, build upon what's working and ditch those extreme resolutions and make practical changes that actually stick. If you're like me, you've benefited from therapy. It has helped so many people I know, and it can help you. If you're thinking of starting therapy, I encourage you to give better help a try. Guys, it's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient and flexible and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire. You get matched with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. They make it that simple. Celebrate the progress you've already made, guys. Visit betterhelp.com slash HSC today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash HSC. Give BetterHelp a try today. Okay, let's go back if you'll indulge me. Um, you have a somewhat uh, famous, amazing dad, Mr. Eugene Levy. Give it up for <laughs> the great. I would venture to say he's just, he's amazing. He is amazing. He, yeah. He's amazing. We can all agree upon that. He's great. So you grow up, if I'm doing my math correctly, you're growing up at some very pivotal... age me right now? Well, I'm just going to say... Go for it. Some pivotal ages. Around 13, Guffman comes out. Yeah. Around 15, American Pie? I can't think of a worse age for a young human being <laughs> whose dad is in American Pie. I was in high school. People thought the movie was about my life. <laughs> it's a miracle you're as together as you are. Like that's I would have killed for my life to be that interesting. <laughs> so yeah, no, it was, it, yeah. Um, but it was interesting, like my relationship to his work was always very removed. Like my family grew up in Toronto, that was an active choice on his part. One Torontonian in the audience. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because he didn't want us around the industry. Right. He wanted to go and do the work and come home to his family. And that, I know now, must have been a huge sacrifice. Right. And yet, that goes to show the leadership that I had, which was a constant prioritization of family, of life, of personal life, over fame or a quest for fame yep. or even success. And he was very lucky in the sense that his talent was so um, unquestionable to the point where he could do that. Um, but I remember all of these movies coming out and th watching them and thinking like, the fuck did you do that? Right. <laughs> when did this happen? <laughs> Who's this movie Was this star? when you Who's were this? gone for three months in March? <laughs> like, uh, now you made Waiting for Guffman? What in God's name? Also, what's in your head? How did you write that? <laughs> totally. And yet it was completely inspiring. Clearly set a good template for you. Um, so, the, so the Cliff Notes version, as I understand it, is film school, breakup, move to England, back home to MTV. Yeah. Do I have that right? You do. So, well, wow. Wikipedia is in Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you didn't pay attention closely to my entire life just independently? I've been watching. Interesting. Watching closely. Uh -huh. um, no, but so film school, so clearly you, you did have a passion. I did three on. and a half years of a four year degree. Is that, 
So that's a bad break. I got a that's job a, at MTV. Yeah. And I thought, I can't pass this up. I'm 20. It's a big job. I hope that I have been promised that I will also be able to produce the work that I do. And that, I think, I've always worked better when I'm doing it. I've always worked better when it's a conversation rather than being taught something. And so I made the choice to leave film school. I said to my film school, can I use my next six months on television, the work that I'm doing, producing, writing, whatever, as credit? They said, no. I said, fuck you. <laughs> um, they've asked me back now many, many times. Have you answered that call? I have been call? offered degrees. And you're stonewalling them, aren't you? No, thank you. <laughs> but it was what it was, and now I'm degreeless and on stage with you. So hey. who won? Who won? This guy. As entertaining as this is, the, the 20 minutes we just had swapping stories about being on red carpets backstage. Oh, that was that was good stuff. Because I will, uh, I, I I have come to listen. You have to be nice on a red carpet. The people asking you the questions don't necessarily want to be asking them. There are producers that tell you what to ask. So, okay. And then you have people like you that always ask really great questions, which is why anytime anyone sees your face on a carpet, it's like a beacon of light. It's a human being. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. But this is about you. Um, you are you, but you are that conflict. And like many of us, I feel the same way. Introvert, extrovert, right? And that must have felt like a very odd. You're on live television a lot in these yeah. high stress environments, having to be on. Yeah. Um, so like, was there was there a sea change? Like, was it fun at first? Did it did it shift at a certain point? It was point? never comfortable. Yeah. But it was fun. And it was exhilarating, and I knew that I was learning something, and I, I am always kind of like at my best when I'm learning. And there just came a point where I realized I've learned what I need to learn. It's not coming naturally. I'm terrible on a red carpet. I'm panic-stricken. I'm mumbling. I'm asking awkward questions. I'm stumbling over my words. It's not for me. There are people who are born to do this job, and I am not one of them. And so there came a point where you say, okay, I'm gonna venture out and hope for the best and see where life takes me. And I wanna say eight months later, we wrote the pilot for Schitt's Creek. We're not gonna talk about Schitt's Creek. Of course we're gonna talk about Schitt's Creek. <laughs> <laughs> Schitt's Creek, okay, let's get into it. Um, so you go, to, you go to your dad with this, and that's a big moment. That's got to be yeah. a scary moment. I mean, he's. I'd never gone to my dad with anything. Right. To the point where I think it's ruined our relationship, <laughs> or it did until we rebuilt it through the show. Um, but no, I think there was a. I think there was a part of him that always wondered why I never came to him. Um, and you know, it's a. We know the culture. We know how judgmental the culture is. We know how easy it is to judge people who happen to come from families of people who are also in in the industry. It's a. It's a fundamentally naive ideology in the sense that, ultimately, it comes down to money and like no one's taking a risk on <laughs> on someone's kid, um, unless the idea is good enough. Yep. And so I had gone not only my whole sort of high school life into college, into MTV, I didn't, they didn't know who my dad was when I auditioned for MTV. I didn't speak about my father on television. Why would I? But for, I wanna say six years or five years. And then when I felt like I had established my own relationship to the audience, I had a successful television show in, in Canada that I had built with my producer and my co-host. I felt okay. I felt independently okay, like I had earned a place in the conversation. And that's when I s brought him in. To we did like a spoof, spoof episode on MTV of My Super Sweet 16, where I took him to a Mercedes Benz dealership and asked him to buy me a car, and he said no. <laughs> um, and so it was only after that when I had done the work, 
came up with the, the seedling of the idea for Schitt's Creek, knew that I had what it took to carry my weight, when you you know when you're in those situations, you almost have to do triple the work, justifiably so, to get to a place where you can go, as I did, to my dad and ask him to work with me. So my question is, is there a plan B? If, God forbid, the great Eugene Levy says, maybe this isn't good for our relationship, maybe this isn't the right thing, uh -huh. is it like, can I get Martin Short's number? Like, what do you like? <laughs> <laughs> There's a list. Um, <laughs> No, I, at that time, was like, maybe I'll be a children's book author. Maybe I'll, I was really, I had, I had to remove ego from the situation. When I walked away from MTV, I made the choice that even though my life was cushy in Toronto and people knew who I was and the show was successful and things were going well, I'm going to make a big change for myself. And part of that has to, has to include not letting the fun parts of the job, not letting the ego-related parts of the job interfere in starting from scratch. If nobody knows who I am, fine. And that continues to be the philosophy. It's hard to believe, but it's all you can do in this industry because the bottom could fall out at any minute. And if you're not okay with going back to where you started or going back to a place, you know, where you came from, then there's a problem. Because you're now starting to be defined by who you've become. And you're chasing something that's that you'll never catch up to. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I mean, I think part of the, the beauty and, and maybe the, the reason, among many reasons, of Schitt's Creek's, Creek's success was that you, you did, it was a passion project, and you did do it kind of like on the cheap at, at first. It was held together with like glue and tape. So when you look back at those that first season, what are the inadvertent or conscious decisions that the lucky time you turned left instead of right you think that is responsible for what it became? Can you pinpoint? You know what? I think what, what, I, what I think is the reason for the success of the show is people allowing it the space to grow. And that's not what TV is for the most part. You know, it's like if you don't have a pilot that hits hard and then your next three episodes don't equally hit hard, you're done. And I, in a way, I, I, I hope that the show can be used as an example of potential in these television shows. We have to invest in the potential of a long-term slow burn because it's worth it. Um... So I really think that CBC up in Canada who made the show and Pop TV in America, which pr previously was the TV Guide Network, yeah. <laughs> we were on standard definition television <laughs> for the first three years of our show. They didn't tell us that at the time, <laughs> but we were. And, and yet, because they needed us, they continued to pick us up. And because we were continually picked up, we were able to grow. And look what happens. A lot. A lot happened. A lot happened. Um, I'm very grateful for, <laughs> for all of it. <laughs> it's not a comedy, guys. It's a drama. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I need to explain that. We approached every episode <laughs> as a drama, but it was the characters and the circumstance Folding in cheese, for example, that offered the comedy. <clears throat> is, that, is that ever quoted to you in restaurants? Does the, the chef come over? Uh, think I am that? probably just as bad as those two in the kitchen, frankly. Okay. Okay. I know. Who wants to date me? <laughs> um, that was a fun scene. That was a really Classic. fun scene to shoot. Oh, my God. How many people assume that Catherine is your mom in real life? Do people ever think that? Um... Yeah, kind of. I mean, I think people just expect to see her every time I'm with my family. Right. <laughs> it's kind of be awkward for her. Yeah, that'd be just tag along. <laughs> no. <laughs> and my mom is so much more capable than Moira Rose. 
On the flip side, on the dramatic side, and this is, has to be the, the level of the show that really must touch you every single day, is just the way this has resonated on a profoundly emotional level with so many people, and especially with queer audiences mm -hmm. seeing their lives depicted in a world where, as you've talked about this a lot, without judgment, without bigotry. And I, I'm curious, like, when you started, did, do you remember when you started to receive that from the audience, to feel that kind of connection and resonance? I think it was, well, I think it started after the um, season finale of season two, when the family says I love you to each other for the first time. And it took like 26 episodes <laughs> to get them to say I love you, but that's how long it took. And I think there was something in that moment that was kind of revelatory for, for people in realizing that this family that they've come to kind of know um, is growing and that there's hope for them. And I think in those early days, people were writing about their own families and how that moment offered uh, hope, whether they had tr troubles in their family, whether they hadn't spoken to relatives, whether there was kind of f fractures. and uh, e That was the first time that I started reading letters. And then, of course, once you know Noah came into the show and once we started to explore the relationship between David and Patrick, and um, that, of course, cracked open a whole other... Yeah conversation, um, which, to be perfectly honest, I was not expecting, uh, genuinely, because I just wanted to write a relationship that spoke to my own experience. I wanted to write, essentially, I wanted to write myself a story right. that was hopeful. Growing up, had you seen any examples that felt... No. Resident? No. <laughs> yeah. N I don't know. I'm gonna have to think on that. Yeah. Well, that's telling. nothing that that's felt telling. That you nothing. Have to that yeah, of course. Yes. Nothing <laughs> that felt. I think about a movie like Maurice, for example. But then again, it's fraught with like. You know, sadness and and loneliness and, and people not being themselves. Right. So no, I don't. I, I I don't. I will probably think of something. I'll think of a handful the yeah. minute we stop talking. Right. But for now, no. I I, I nothing that was relaxed and easy and flawed and um, and not met with violence. Yeah. So if it's not there, create it. Create, create kind the, of. the world that you... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I knew I had the opportunity. I knew that we were, were likely not going anywhere. We were in a very lucky situation where I knew that we were likely going to be able to tell this story for as long as we could because it was a value to the places that we're keeping it on air. We were the big fish in the small pond. Yeah. And what a lucky thing. So, yeah, I, 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 it wasn't even a risk because I didn't think of it that way. But I did know that there was a story I wanted to tell that likely couldn't have been told on network television in America. Are you the friend in your friend group that maybe treats yourself a little bit better than everybody else? That's okay, I'm, I'm that guy too. You like to treat yourself well, Maybe it's getting that super expensive coffee once or twice a day. That's me. Getting the extra leg room on a flight because, damn it, you deserve it. Well, here's my question for you. If you're going to treat yourself to those kinds of things, why not treat yourself to the best options when finding a doctor? Your health is the most important thing in your life, bar none. Enter our sponsor, ZocDoc. It's the place where you can find and book Tens of thousands of top-tier doctors, all with verified patient reviews. You heard me. Verified patient reviews. Don't settle. Go for the best and find the right doctor for you today. With ZocDoc, you've got more options than you know. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors, in-network, near you, and instantly book appointments with them online. Once you find the doc you want, you can book them immediately. No more waiting and awkwardly waiting on hold and praying that you get that appointment. You've got it. You're there. You're in. If I needed a doc, I would use ZocDoc. Go to ZocDoc.com slash happy said. Download the ZocDoc app for free. That's free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor 
today. That's ZocDoc, Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash happy sad. ZocDoc dot com slash happy sad. Obviously, this show, as it should be, is so precious to you, and I know you get asked every day, but like, how much time have you spent even ruminating on what to do with these None. characters? None. It's, just, it's too soon. It's, it's n- n- Is it a matter of if, not when, or when, not if? What's the... No, it's like... I don't know. I just... You... you sometimes it's okay to not have what we want. Right. I know it, it goes special. against our culture, <laughs> but you, we left on, a, on the highest possible note a television show could leave on. I don't think you could do better. And so I'm so aware of the relationship that an audience has to TV. The loyalty, the legacy, the, the feeling of returning to something. You always return to the shows that leave you wanting more. You never return to the shows that overstay their welcome. And part of the gift of this show, at least from my perspective, is the fact that we left people wanting to go back and watch the show over and over and over, and in some cases, over and over and over. Um, And I don't wanna, I care too much for the audience to ever tip that relationship to a place where they don't want to return to Schitt's Creek. You think you want it, guys, but you just want... The I don't know. We'll see. If it comes to me, I don't know. In the early days, I was, like, thinking about, like, spin-offs. I had spin-off ideas. And then, I don't know, there's something very kind of elegant about leaving it be. Do you have one spin-off idea that you now know you'll never do that you contemplated for a second? I really wanted to take... Alexis to New York City. Come on. Come on. Dan. Dan. This is an 800-person intervention. Uh, that is Do a it. conversation for another time. <laughs> but, yeah. How I far had, down that road did you go? Kind of. I, I kind of had a sense. And, and the reason, in a nutshell, not to do it is? For another time. Okay. I'm rattled. I'm rattled here today. Okay. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I know you, you've talked about hating auditioning back in the day. Are you, I hate auditioning now. I was going to ask, are yeah. you... Because like you've created the best roles for yourself. No one is using you as they should. Like You're creating great... I, mean, I appreciate that. Hopefully those people will listen to this, this podcast. This is what I'm saying. So like what kind of stuff are you even in the mix for? Are you, like, is there anything... Uh, like, di- like versions of David Rose that are not written as well. Yeah. Frankly, yeah. Um, and then some other s- things. Is is there any kind of thing you want us collectively to secret into the universe for you? I don't know. I mean, you know, it's it's kind of tragic. Like, at the bare minimum, I'd like to know who his friends are or who his family is. <laughs> hey, you know, you think about it. Like all of these, a lot of c- sort of queer characters in various television shows and movies are like, you know. Yeah, honey, you go and get your man. And it's like, <laughs> could, yeah, yeah. No, that line is, um, I'll say it, but can I know, like, does he have a partner? Like, do, what does he do when he goes home? At noth- oh, nothing, we don't care. Okay, great, so just, and the line is, oh, honey, go get that guy. Like, I don't know what it is, but it's tough out there. Yeah. Still. Yeah. Even after Schitt's Creek, I thought that might have helped in some ways, and it has. There's great work being done, right? But it's not mass amounts of it. Yeah. Is there a show that if they came calling, like White Lotus comes calling, I'm in? Like, is there anything like that? Oh, of that, course. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I would have, I would have done pretty much anything to be on Succession. That I mean, you know, there's such amazing TV being made. Um, yeah, of course. Um, we're going to get to the audience questions in just a second, but before we do that, let's do the happy, sad, confused, profoundly random questionnaire for you, Dan. Great. What's the wallpaper on your phone? A Cy Twombly 
a painting. Very nice. And it looks like it's broke. Everyone thinks my phone is shattered, but it's not. <laughs> it's art, guys. It's art, everybody. <laughs> I'm arty. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> now that I've said that out loud, it sounds really pretentious, but it's not. I just like the painting. Anyway. That's our gif of the day. Thanks, uh -huh. Dan. What a um, dick. <laughs> uh, last actor you were mistaken for? Uh, oh, Johnny Galecki. <laughs> a lot of people are confuse me, think that I'm on the Big Bang Theory. Oh. And I was like, mm, I would have killed for that paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what did not pay that. Shit's Creek, everybody. <laughs> Despite what you think. Not big money there. Anyway. Uh, the best karaoke song of all time is? One Day More from Les Mis. <laughs> you got to get people on board. You got to do the whole chorus. Oh, wow. But it's a banger. <laughs> You wet it all out? You, 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 oh, yeah. God, yeah. I mean, you have to get the right people. Sure. But yes. <laughs> I dare you to perform one day more in a karaoke room with people who are very passionate and not feel a transcendent electricity. You have a fancy wife. Name drop. Who's the coolest person you've ever karaokeed with? Come on. There's somebody. There's a story. I think, well, I, the, probably F Florence Pugh. That works, yeah. It was worth the wait, we got it. Yeah, she's fucking great. <laughs> Did you duet? Did well, you I was wondering if like, cause there was a point where I didn't know, anyway, I didn't know if she was actually in the room. There was a night where we all went out and then it got to karaoke, but I was like replaying the night in my head. <laughs> so Cut two, wasn't there, calls me tomorrow. <laughs> Pissed. <laughs> I would never karaoke. It's not who I am. Anyway, she would never. <laughs> She's the greatest. Worst note a director has ever given you? Can you recall a moment on set? It wasn't a note. It was a producer right before I was about to do something. And they told me to calm down. <laughs> and then... I could do all the campy stuff. And what I was doing, folks, was not campy. <laughs> I think they were referring to another word, starting with an F. Um, but I'm not putting words in anyone's mouth. I'm just going to titillate with a little <laughs> blind item, I guess. Anyway, it was bad. That's not good. Um... Don't use campy inappropriately with a gay man before he's about to perform. <laughs> Don't do it, because it will come back to haunt you. Um, in the spirit of happy, sad, confused, who's an actor that always makes you happy? <gasps> Emma Thompson. This is a good answer, mm -hmm. yes. A movie that makes you sad? Cinema Paradiso. The music alone. But good sad. Oh my gosh, yeah. One of the great scores of all time. Amazing. One of the great movies. Uh, food that makes you confused. <laughs> now we're talking, yeah, let's get into it. Like a steamed fish? Oh. <laughs> sure. I just ordered one la like two nights ago and then immediately questioned why I did it. Right. Because. It's almost I like thought I was being healthy, and then it came, and I was like, I don't want this. Yeah. What is this? Right. Some steamed vegetables all around it? I don't know what this is. Yeah. Yeah. It's that fry it. Just fry it. Yeah. No, it's that gray zone. It's like, do sushi. I don't great, want that. Or really cook it. Don't half-ass it. It's like it was microwaved or something. I don't know. Okay. Uh, we have some wonderful questions from the audience. You ready? Sure. Who did all the paintings artwork at the end of the film? The artwork is beautiful, oh. of course. And I know this is it was great, wasn't yeah. it? Um, a Canadian painter named Chris Knight, who is so great and is such a talent, and I'd been following him for such a long time. And I, in fact, own a couple uh, pieces of his. And when 
I got the green light on the movie, it was in the script. It was all kind of scripted, obviously. I mean, it's, anyway, <laughs> stupid thing to say. But the movie was kind of predicated on these paintings, and I knew that, like, if we didn't get the paintings right, we could, you know, it could teeter into very cheesy territory. Right. So the minute I got the green light on the film, I called Chris, cold called. We'd never met. We followed each other on Instagram, and I asked him to be a part of it. And he had, he told me that a week prior, he was having a conversation about Francesco Clemente's work on Great Expectations, ghost painting right. on Great Expectations, and how he'd always kind of been curious about doing that. And then a week later, I called. Um, and he did it. And he, he, you know, he allowed this movie like a safe place to land, ultimately. And that's an amazing thing when, when art can, can do that. Uh, Heather would like to know why you decided to set this movie in the UK. Uh, because I wanted to. Uh, no, because I wanted Mark to be not at his, not in his home. I wanted him to be a fish out of water. I also think there's something to be said about a character moving to a place in their 20s, as I did w with London. I moved there when I was in my early 20s. And the relationships that you form with people when you are by yourself in a new place. So it felt like it really lent to the concept of like found family for him, that these two would be the f sort of the first two friends he made in the backstory, was that they would be kind of the first two friends that he made and they ended up living together. And, and so it essentially forced a kind of intimacy um, and, and sense of displacement like for, for Mark so that he was running away from things and ultimately when he found his husband there, like that was it, his life just stayed. Um, so it was a distraction, it was isolation, it was all of those things. And London's great, and you know. Uh, Tiffany would like to know how you approached finding the balance for the viewer between gut-wrenching grief and humor so perfectly. I mean, th this is, I mean, we, we've obviously joked about this, about approaching Schitt's Creek as a drama first, but then, you know, you can almost like invert the ratio here. A yeah, it's kind bit. of the reverse of that. Right. But I think it's not even, I don't even know if it is perfectly in a way, I think it's kind of, um, I mean, thank you for saying so, but I, I think it's it's messy, and it's clunky, and it's uncomfortable, and that's all intentional, because that's what life is, I think. You know, we've all been in situations, be it funerals or weddings, when someone takes the mic and you're left gobsmacked <laughs> that this person had the audacity to take up space in such an inappropriate time and place. That is life. Humor comes in like our saddest times because it has to. I think laughter and, and humor is, is like the greatest coping mechanism we have. So these moments of, of levity, these moments of like laughter in the movie are intentionally uncomfortable because that to me is what life is. So, um, and then some, I mean, I was sort of backstage listening to some laughs and I was like, didn't even know that was funny, okay? <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, so that was, it was important to show those moments of, of laughter, to show, to break the, the tension a little bit. Uh, John L. would like to know, um, well first, thank you for a beautiful film. Was the scene on the bus with you looking over at the lady with the dog, your nod to Redmond? Yeah, <laughs> it was. This is Anthony. As a queer person making an LGBTQ-focused film, what did you want to be sure to convey about gay relationships in good grief? I didn't want it to convey anything. And I don't actually, I mean, I appreciate the question, but I don't even consider it an LGBTQ film. I think it, it is inherently in the sense that the, it, it very much involves it, but I, I don't think it would be defined by that. And I think that's the point. All I can do is like write to my own experience. And I think the minute that you try to make anything more out of your stories, the minute that you try to make meaning out of something, it loses its authenticity a little bit. And so I think what I try to do at least is to just remove the greater meaning behind it, write what I want to write, and hope that the, I hate using the word normal, but like the normalcy, uh, the, the, 
the kind of nonchalance of of the subject matter, that that kind of speaks on behalf of like a greater meaning in a way. I think that was certainly what we tried to do with with Schitt's Creek too, and I think it was because it was not treated differently, or it wasn't pedestalized, or, or it didn't um, it didn't have this like active meaning. Right. That's you're what not I underlining think. the points. You're yeah, sliding. because we deserve that. Yeah, you know. Um, Allison and Ray would like to know, uh, can you, I uh, would rather want to hear you speak about the role music plays in your creative process. Are you writing to music? Are you playing music? Yeah, I playlist staff? everything. Like yeah. every project, I, there's a playlist before I even start writing. And I will go on hikes uh, every day and put the music in my ears and think. And oftentimes like scenarios and character and dialogue and moments will come to me while I'm listening to music. Uh, Tina Turner in Schitt's Creek came to me while I was h hiking with music in my ears and, and it was part of the playlist that I had put together for Schitt's Creek. You know, when I needed that song, I went back to that playlist and thought, okay, what could, what could we slow down? Music is like such an important, has always has been such an, like, an important and informative thing for me in the creative process and season kent who was the music supervisor on the film was like the greatest partner in crime on this because we both thought well what are, what are the weirdest choices what are the strangest and yet they all made sense because they all served the story and it was also important that in in this case music spoke a lot of the music choices we made spoke to their relationship of these friends when they first became friends right again those kind of the Not early Robin, yeah. the Annie heartbeats, all of those kind of moments mixed in with, with a kind of timeless, like, can't place it, mix and match. Well, as you were saying before, it's telling the story without dialogue, whether yeah. it's production design or music. These are the yeah. shortcuts for a filmmaker yeah. that really tell it all. Um, so what's up next? Are you going to do Les Mis on Broadway? Or are you I'm doing Les Mis on Broadway. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, I'll be back here talking about the worst reviews you've ever seen for Les Mis on Broadway. Would you ever do a musical? Would you I would write love a musical to do or be in a musical or both or I I would love to do a musical. Uh, I, I don't know. My whole thing is I have to feel like I'm going to bring something additive to any job I take. So whatever that musical is, God bless whoever asks me. <laughs> Um, it would have to be something additive. I don't know. I'm going to take a break, I think. Yes. Well deserved. Yeah, I'm going to take a break. I think you need to live your life to be able to write about your life. And sometimes you get to a point where you think, oh, I haven't, I haven't really done much recently um, except exist in this like cyclone of whatever the hell this industry this is, is. This is normal life, Dan. What are you talking so about? So you have yeah. to step outside. You have to take, you know, like Michaela Cole said it so eloquently about just going away. Yeah. Um, we'll let you go into your cave and do whatever it is your real life. Cut to it's like a week. They're like, why is he back? He <laughs> said he was going away. Need I actors. Know. I want to travel for a bit and Good. we'll see. But there's some, there's, there's always some, some things in the fire. Um, I'm so thrilled this film exists and this, that this career continues to evolve in wonderful ways. It has, I mean, I'm seeing the connections as I was alluding to before in that, you know, these projects have humanity and humor and reality and, and, and relatability. And, and I'm just thrilled of what's come in the last few years and I'm thrilled at what's gonna come in the future. Oh, um, good Grief, as you guys well know, is a great piece of work. It's on Netflix, spread the good word. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much Ladies for coming and, and watching. It means the world. Thank Dan you. Webby. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for such great questions. Thanks, it's a thrill. And so ends another edition of Happy, Sad, Confused. Remember to review, rate, and subscribe to this show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm a big podcast person. I'm Daisy Ridley, and I definitely wasn't pressured to do this by Josh. Ha <laughs> ha